announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Thank you, Wendy. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel mandate to proclaim your kingdom, to demonstrate the power of your kingdom, the reality through healing. And we thank you for the impartation that enables us to do your work. Freely you have received, freely give. We pray that today we would receive and give. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we won't have any sport updates this morning, though both the Sharks and the Western Province did well again yesterday. The Australians are getting nasty and they want to pull out of the Super 15 because they are just getting smashed by the South African teams, but we won't worry about that today. We'll just love them and be nice to them, especially if there are any Australians here today. Don't we love Australians? Love your enemies and all of that? Hallelujah. Anyway, we're coming to the end of this um, GT3 series that we've been doing. Gospel transformation, generous togetherness, global transmission. And that's the one we're going to look at today. And uh, there's another way that you could look at this. And I really think that this is what God has called His church and this church to be. I've looked at the history of this church and I've looked at the scriptures and I think that this is what uh, the church, the kind of DNA of the church is meant to be, GT3. And you can think of it like this, be changed by Jesus, that's gospel transformation. Be nice to each other, that's generous togetherness. And be used by God, that's gospel transmission. So you could think of it, if you're really dumb like me, a little slogan. Be changed, be nice, be used. And uh, let's just think about the nice for a minute. Doesn't it just shock you sometimes how church people can just be so plain nasty to each other? Eh? This is nasty little comments, nasty little things that we do. And if you want to change the church, here's a prayer. You better write this down. It's long and it's very theological. Dear Lord Jesus, please make me nicer. Wouldn't that be great? Just imagine if everybody in this church was being changed by Jesus, was becoming nicer to each other, and was being used by God in his mission. That would be revival. That would be like heaven on earth. It would certainly be the nicest church in Camps Bay. It would be the nicest church in Cape Town, huh? Eh? What do you think? So, so you know, you can, you can test yourself on these things. The end of each day, you can say, was I a little more changed by Jesus today? Am I changing? Was I a little more nice today or was I just playing nasty old Mike you know and was I used a little more today by God you know you can you can you can make the 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 gospel so complicated but it's really about being changed so that we're nice and so that we can be used you know isn't that what it's all about So when you meet with your brothers and sisters, just think, I've got to be nice to these horrible people. (laughs) No. You know, they're nice people. Are they nice? Absolutely. So we want to be nice to each other. This morning, we're thinking about global transmission, being used by God. And by transmission, I mean the spreading mission. And it's not so much that the church has a mission for God but that the God of mission has a church. That's a quote, I think, from um, David Bosch, who was probably one of the greatest mission thinkers of our generation. And uh, that's really the reality. The God of mission. Somebody once said that two-thirds of God's name is go. 
You see, even I can work that one out, in English anyway. Go is two-thirds of the name of God. He is a God of mission, and he has a church. Do you know what the church is all about? It's about mission. God has a, ch has a church to do his mission. And we're thinking about that today. And didn't Jonathan Macris get us thinking about mission? Were any of you here last week? I was here. And I just was blessed by him. And, and some of you were surprised when he started, let me show you some photos of my family. You all thought you'd see him feeding goats in Greece and all of that. And, and what an amazing story of a man who grew up in Irinjaya or something like that. Eh? And, and then his father was dying of a terminal disease and he went home and he got miraculously healed. He went to Greece. And that family, they've just spent their whole lives in the mission of God. That's, what it, that's, that's Christianity 101. I'm just so encouraged that, that I could meet him. And, and, and we kind of clicked there, you know. Um, and uh, I, I feel that, that I want to get involved in the evangelization of Greece, don't you? Even if it only means that I stay in South Africa and just pray for him. But he's such a nice guy. And he said to me, why don't you come over to Greece in November and run the Athens Authentic Marathon. From Marathon to Athens. As a fundraiser, of course. What do you think? Anyone want to join me? <laughs> huh? We're going to train for that. Sandy's going to join me. Uh, you just got to get your airfare to Greece and get a pair of running shoes. What do you think? It's a good idea. Anyway, we're not thinking about uh, running marathons. We're thinking about mission and... Uh, I think Jonathan Macris helped us just begin to see how the God of mission has a church. And we're going to look at three areas of mission today, or three aspects of mission. Mission areas, mission actions, and mission anointings. Very easy to remember. You, you're beginning to realize that I'm a very dumb, simple person, and so I've got to keep it straightforward. And so that's what we're going to think about. First of all, we're going to think about some mission areas, local, regional, global. You know the, the verse, Acts 1.8, where we see the three areas of the mission of God. Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, appeared to his church and he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, my mission. You'll be doing the mission where? Locally, regionally, and Globally, in Jerusalem, which for them was local, in Judea and Samaria, which for them was regional, and to the ends of the earth, which for them and for everyone is global. So there we see the three areas of mission, local, regional, global. I think that Christian life, Camps Bay, is very good at the local, and to some extent, the regional. This church does a hang of a lot in the local area, right? And in the region. What about the global? Sometimes people say, no, there's too much need in South Africa to worry about the global. We cannot give anything away because we are too needy, we are too poor in Africa. And that's been the perennial attitude of Africa that they always have a receiving mentality. You've got to come and help us. We are needy. And I think that is a very sad, mistaken approach to the threefold mission areas of God. A believer is never, ever too poor to give something. And I'm going to just mention two scriptures. They're not exactly related to world mission, but they're about giving, which is part of mission. And the one is the well-known scripture, which is known as the widow's hanky. No. She didn't throw her hanky into the offering or her tissue. She threw her mite, which in the King James Version uh, refers to a very small coin. And Jesus is looking at the temple and he's seeing the people giving big and giving much, the rich. And then he sees this poor widow with virtually nothing 
And uh, one would have expected her to go and say, give me something. I am a poor widow. But no, she gave, as Jesus said, out of her poverty, she put in all that she had to live on. She wasn't too poor to give to the mission of God, which at that time was centered in the temple. And then there's the other great example of the generosity of the Macedonians. Paul comments, he's, he's just blown away by the generosity, and where is Macedonia, it just occurs to me, in Greece. Is God saying something? I don't know. The generosity of the Macedonians, Paul, he just is astonished by their desire to bless the suffering Jewish people in Jerusalem, and they give to the collection that Paul takes for the suffering uh, Jewish people uh, in Jerusalem. And he says their extreme poverty, he's talking about the Macedonians, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They gave as much as they were able and, able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, which was in Jerusalem, which was far away. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't ever say, we in South Africa are so poor, we in, in, in Hout Bay are so poor, that everything must be for me and for us and for our situation. No, we must be local. We must be regional. But let's never ever forget that we are part of a global Mission. It's very weak in South African churches. When I worked in the UK, just about every evangelical church has some cross-cultural missionaries that they pray for. They have a board, the missionaries, that, and, and they're in Cambodia, and they're in uh, South Africa. You know, they see us as a mission station, and, and uh, they see Durban as a really lost place. Eh? Uh, hallelujah. They sent me to Durban as a missionary. No. I just went back to heaven when I went back from England to Durban. <laughs> went back to, to paradise. But uh, in England, they have this mentality of global mission. And, and in America and in these other kind of places, but in South Africa, how many churches do you know in Cape Town that have cross-cultural missionaries outside of South Africa that they're supporting? They're very, very few. Because we think that we've got to focus on the local and the regional. We must, but we must also think about the global uh, aspect, area of mission. So I want to ask you a question, and you can respond to me if you like, if you're bold. Where might the global frontiers of our mission be today? Where, where, where's the cutting edge of global mission in the 21st century? Any ideas? Only God knows. You think it could be America, North America? Yeah? What about Western Europe, post-Christian? Uh, the 1820 window, as Tani's saying, that's the Middle East. Middle East in a mess, eh? Not just Israel, but Jordan. And in a moment, Tani's going to share what's happening in, in Syria. Syria is in... Hell has arrived in Syria. And then the, the countries that are shut to the gospel, the, the, the so-called Islamic countries. Could that be the, the frontier? Places like Albania, very communist, uh, North Korea. How many missionaries are in North Korea? That's the frontier. It used to be China, but now China is the, has the fastest growing Christian population in the world. Soon there'll be more Christians in China than the rest of the world put together. This is a huge revival going on in China. But still, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a frontier. I remember a, a guy called Arthur Blessed who used to walk around the world carrying the cross. Any of you remember him? And he walked in parts of China where they had never, ever, ever seen a cross or heard the name of Jesus. And while he was walking in China one day, he saw an old man, an old man in his 80s, weeping. And, and he went and through an interpreter, he asked, why are you weeping? And he said, because I thought Christianity had died out, and I was the only Christian left on earth. 
And Arthur assured him and said, there's hundreds of millions of Christians and they are praying for you in China. So there's a lot of places, even in China, that, that are a mission area. So do you, do you see what I'm saying to you? We need to not forget that there are three areas. Local, the regional, and the global. Let's have a global perspective in our church. Even if it means we just pray for cross-cultural missionaries. Pray for Jonathan Macris. Pray for people in Albania and in North Korea, etc. Okay, should we move on? Definitely. Secondly, mission action, social and evangelistic. You can sum up the activity of mission as social and evangelistic. They're expressed in the second great commandment and the great commission. What's the second great commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we love people and as we care for them, we're doing the social actions of mission. What's the great commission? Go and make disciples of all nations. That's evangelistic action. It's described or pictured in the parables of Jesus where he says you are salt, which is social action, preservation of standards and morality and love and justice, and you are also light, evangelistic impact. Those are the actions of mission. And here at Camps Bay Church, we're committed to both those activities. We're very good in the area of the social. Not so? Giving stuff, giving money, helping people. We need to be strong, equally strong, in the area of evangelism. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to be running an Alpha course in July. It's a very easy and a very good way to do direct evangelism. And you can all be involved, even if it's just praying for the Alpha course. Or maybe you want to invite somebody and bring them along. Or maybe you want to get involved as a helper or as a group leader. Or maybe you want to help with a meal. Uh, or in, just in some way, by getting involved, you're getting involved in a mission action. And it's evangelistic. I commend it to you. When are we starting? End of July. So think about, maybe there's a friend. I've got one or two people. I'm going to invite them. And I'm going to be there. I'm going to be leading it. I have to be there. <laughs> you see, I don't have a choice. It's lovely to be a, a pastor because you do all the good stuff because you have to. You're paid to do it. You see, it's easy. You know, it looks so holy, but it's like, my goodness me. A lot of, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I was going to say something nasty. And I, I'm not allowed to say nasty things. Because I'm a Christian. Did you, how many of you know that? You see, Christians say nice things to each other. And then thirdly, what was the third A? This is where I get excited. Because this is the one I really love. Mission anointing. It's often the one that's left out. In evangelical churches, the preacher would be coming into land now. You see, they'd be going for tea. They've talked about the areas. They've talked about the actions. How are you going to do it? You need the anointing. Received and given. We're coming to the heart of exactly how we're meant to do the stuff. The impartation for mission. And that's the passage that Wendy read for us. Should we have a look at it again? And if, if, if this is the only thing you take home, let it be. This is like the good stuff. I always leave the best to last. So all the rest was just padding. No, I'm joking. Matthew 10, 7 to 8. Have you got it in front of you? should be on the screen as well. There it is. As you go, Jesus is preparing his first disciples for the mission of God. He says, you're going to go. And as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. That's the announcement of the gospel, that God is actively establishing his authority on the earth so as to get his will done. Go and announce the message. Proclaim the kingdom. Heal the sick. That's the demonstration 
of the kingdom, that the gospel is true, that there is power and healing and salvation in the name of Jesus. It's not just empty words. This is power, the power of God unto salvation. Heal the sick as a demonstration of the reality of the message. And, and really radical healing is raising the dead. You can't get more sick than dead. You know? And even the dead must rise in the name of Jesus. It's wonderful. Think of Lazarus. Out of the tomb he came after four days. Radically healed. Cleanse those who have leprosy. In other words, incurable diseases must turn around uh, when we're doing evangelism. It's not, oh dear, he's got AIDS. I only pray for flu. You know? You can pray for anything, even leprosy. And drive out demons, which is just an awful affliction of the enemy. So we've talked about kingdom proclamation, kingdom demonstration, and now we need to go on and read the rest of the verse, which is about kingdom impartation, mission anointings. This is how you get to do the stuff. Freely you have received freely give. Take that home with you. Freely you have received, freely give. That's how you get to play. John Wimber used to say, we all get to play because freely you've all received. Freely give. Another way of translating that would be you received gratuitously Give gratuitously. In the kingdom, everything's free. Isn't that great? There's no charge. It's free. And that's really what ministry and mission is all about. Just give away what you've received. You receive the anointing. Give it away. The problem is, if you've got nothing, you've got nothing to give. And so it really begins with learning how to receive. And that's partly what church is all about. Uh, I had a friend once who was a, a pastor in Germany, and in German, which I don't know, the name of his church was the Filling Station. Because people came there to learn how to receive, so that they had stuff to give. And I like that. When you come to church on Sunday, it should be to receive. And in the meeting place, it becomes the learning place for the marketplace. So we should be learning how to receive the anointing here so that we can get an anointing in the marketplace and give it away. A pastor said to me the other day, no, in our church, um, we don't allow the gifts of the Spirit to be manifest because they are messy and they insult and affect the visitors. So we want people to do the stuff in life, i.e. manifest the gifts of the Spirit at the pick and pay. And one pastor actually said that to me. He said, if my people, I forgot to tell him they were Jesus' people, but I was nice. And he said, my people, if they want to manifest the gift of tongues, can do so in the car park at the pick and pay. What do you think of that? So I said to him, you know what, if your people never get the opportunity to play in church, they're never going to play in the world where people are not nice. And where if you manifest the prophetic gift badly in the pick and pay shopping center, you will be had for breakfast, you see. You're in a board meeting, and you see that the CEO has got a broken leg. And you pray for him, and he gets worse. You're in big trouble, you see. He's, he's not a nice guy. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry. Mike Skevington is a rubbish Christian who doesn't know how to pray. And so he spat in my face, screamed at me, and I got a headache as well as a broken leg. This is where we learn. The meeting place is the learning place for the marketplace. The mission out there 
This is how we learn to do this stuff. And so what we need to be learning in church, how do you receive the anointing so that you can give it away? It's actually a very simple flow. You get it, you give it. That's, min- that's ministry. That's mission. That's what he's talking about here. Freely you have received. Freely give. But if you've received nothing, then what you're giving them is just the best of your flesh. And you know, I'll tell you a secret. People don't want you. They want Jesus. They want the anointing. You know, let's be honest. Joshua gets a headache and says, Dad, will you pray for me? So I do my best. He doesn't want my best. He wants healing. And I don't know how to heal. Even doctors don't know how to heal. They just know what does heal. Because God has built healing into the human body. And so then they charge you for the gifts of God. (laughs) I didn't say that. They say doctors bury their mistakes. Pastors have them sitting in the front row. And your mistakes never go to another church. (laughs) You didn't get that one. That was, you know what that was? Nasty. Sorry, Lord. Change me. You see, when you get nasty like that, you repent. It's part of the gospel. Am I, am I making any sense? Not really. You say, you know what, Mike, I don't actually believe what you're saying. Can you show me anywhere in the Bible where this happens? Yes, I can. Let's have a look at Acts chapter 3, the healing of the lame man. Do you remember the story? Peter and John went to pray, which is a nice thing to do. They're going up to the temple, the hour of prayer. They see a lame man. What does he do? He's, it's just like South Africa. He asks for money. He says, hey, man, I'm a beggar. I'm lame. You must help me. I've noticed in Cape Town, the beggars are quite aggressive. Eh? Like they walk with you. They're not lame. You wish they were lame. It's like, go away. But then I've got to remember that I'm a Christian. I just, I nearly just said I wish because I, I should be moving in this. I should be able to say to these guys, guess what? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have in the name of Jesus, you're set free. From your affliction. You think they get a shock? I'm going to tell you a story just now about a person who got healed and didn't really expect it. We're going to come to that, just in case you're getting bored. But in Acts chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, Peter said, I have no silver and gold. Someone said the Roman church has really changed, eh? Because now Peter can say, I've got a lot of silver and a lot of gold, all the Vatican treasures. But they don't have the anointing. Ah, I'm stopping. That was also nasty. (laughs) Sorry. Anyway, Peter said, I have no silver and gold. But listen to this. What I have, I give to you. What did he have? He had the anointing. In the name of Jesus Christ. You notice he didn't pray. He commanded healing because he had the anointing. He knew healing was coming to this beggar. And so he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. Have you ever thought about that? Where do you think Peter got that anointing? Do you think he had it in his back pocket and he was always, he was just carrying a healing anointing for for any lame beggar that he ever met. And so uh, he's walking up to pray. And he sees the lame man. Oh, yes, let's get that anointing out. Here we are. Take it. I don't think it worked like that. I think Peter and John, and they had nothing. They were just going to pray, and they met a lame man. They had no money. And as Peter looked at him, if you read the whole passage, he looked at him, and the guy looked at him, and something happened. Peter got the anointing. And he just knew God is going to touch this man. And so he said to him, look at me. The guy looked at him and he expected a rand. And he said, sorry, pal, I've got no money. The guy's heart sank. He was already looking away. Peter said, no, look at me. And as he looked at him, he said, what I do have, I give you. And he gave him what he'd got. Freely you've received. 
freely give. And what did he get? He got healed. I'll tell you a story. It happened quite dramatically for me. We were in a church in Point Road for 13 years, Christ Church Addington. And uh, just down the way was the Catholic Church. And a lady came into our meeting one Sunday evening and she came to the wrong church. She thought she was going to the Catholic Church and she by accident walked into the Anglican Church. It was a very dreadful thing to do. And in the meeting, she decided to stay because we were such nice people. So she stayed. In the meeting, God gave me a word of knowledge. It was just I had a thought. It was like a half a thought. I was just saying, Lord, what do you want to do here tonight? And I got a thought. There's somebody here with a damaged wrist. So I just spoke it out at the end of the meeting. I said, I believe there could be somebody here who's damaged her wrist. This lady was like, she started walking up the aisle because she wasn't an Anglican. She didn't know how to behave properly. She started shouting, which we never do. And she started walking up the aisle and she said, how did you know? And I said, I can see you're a Catholic by the way you shout. No. (laughs) She was just like, how did you know? And I nearly said, I took a guess, because that's what it felt like. But as she started, and Joshua might remember the story, because he played a little role at the end of the story, and we'll get back to that. He was a young boy at that stage. So as she's walking up the aisle, I just felt the anointing come on me. And it doesn't happen very often. I wish it did. And I just shouted at her. I said, go to the Catholic Church. No, I didn't do that. (laughs) That was just to get your attention. Because that's not a nice thing to say. I just said, as she, she's like she's walking up the aisle. She's just going, she's holding her arm out like a said, How did you know? I just said, stretch out your hand. And just without thinking, she, and she was instantly healed. And this is where Joshua comes in. The big part of the story. As she walked out, she gave him 50 rand. Which is not good because you're not allowed to charge for the gifts of the Spirit. It's called simony. It's very naughty. If God uses you to heal someone, unlike a doctor, you're not allowed to charge. You see? It's free. What does it say? Freely you've received. Much as I would have loved to say to her, only 50 for that. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) completely free but do you see what I'm talking about I had nothing that night in fact while I was seeing her walk up the aisle I was thinking about the TV show that I was about to go and watch as I left church and I was like slightly irritated this woman was lengthening the service and then the anointing came on me and I gave it away that's ministry that is how you do the mission of God you get the anointing Give it away. We've got to learn to get it so we can give it. Pauline had uh, a similar experience. Anyone want to come and just tell us about it? it was very, she shared it at the end of the, the, the fast uh, day on... What day did we fast? Thursday. Let's have the microphone for you. Just share with us quickly how you, what you shared in that meeting, how you got it, and you gave it to this guy, and he got healed. Listen to this. So it's not just Mike Skevington 200 years ago. Okay. On Wednesday night, I think it was, we had a hike leaders meeting at Hillary's. And our scrambler leader arrived hobbling. um, And he had a very painful big toe, the side of his big toe. Um, He was rather disappointed because Alan had asked him if he could hike with the township children. They were going to City Rock for the first time. The teacher at the Silicamfa High was bringing some boys to climb in City Rock. And it's a place in town that has a climbing wall. And we were really hoping for Keith to be there. So he, you know, we discussed it and somebody said it's gout. And he said, you know, how does it come anyway? He, he really ha- had the, the morbs, I would say. And, um, so I just felt, you know, I felt the nudge from the Holy Spirit that we should pray, but it was a hike leaders meeting, and um, I, I just kept quiet. And the whole meeting went on, and the next thing we said goodbye, and we had prayed, and I felt again, you know, how uh, we really should have prayed. 
And as we were walking into the street, he came up to say goodbye, and I, I just felt uh, the Lord say, this is your last chance. <laughs> so I just pointed to his toe, and I said, toe, be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> and as he walked away to his car, he actually said, I receive it, but he told me last night that he didn't really believe that he would be healed, but as he walked to his car, he felt the pain go completely. And the next day, he was climbing with the boys in City Rock. So mm. that was just so amazing. Thank you. That is um, amazing. Mike, can yes. I just tell a little story as quickly as possible? You may certainly do that. On Tuesday night, we had a meeting with all the people involved in our why, because you've been speaking about being used by God to love your neighbor, the commandment and the mm. commission to go and make disciples. So this healing is minor to actually yeah. how God used me subsequently this week. Uh, so we had our meeting and we had heard and Alan and I had met with this vineyard pastor in Awai on the day before about a stabbing that had happened on the weekend again in Awai and somebody had died and then the next day there was a raid by these dropout kids that aren't going to school on the Silicampa school in the, in the play, playground. And so I had really been quite discouraged when we had discussed it with you. Mm. But Alan and I had agreed to go and help this vineyard pastor because he started Alpha in the township. And um, it was going to be on Friday night, and he said he has 40 kids. So I, I felt really discouraged when I heard this problem, and I just felt the Lord... I had heard a sermon recently where we are being called to be eagle Christians and not chickens in a barnyard and that we need to see the storm as an opportunity. And I just felt, to encourage myself and everybody there at the meeting, we need to see the storm. There's an opportunity that's going to come. And um, we went on Friday night, and of those 40 children, 17 gave their lives to mm. the Lord. And I had the privilege of taking three young girl teenagers. I want to encourage Brownie. Things are happening three girls and led them to the Lord and I just walked away Wonderful. and I felt the Lord say, there's the opportunity Pauline, it's right next door to you. Amen. So. Thank you Pauline, isn't that great? <laughs> Thank you. But you see, just getting back to that healing, she got it, she just got a sense that God was going to do it, she gave it away. How did she give it away? Commanded healing. That's what the anointing is all about. You don't have to pray, oh God, in your good time and according to your will, just speak it. Toe, I command you to be obedient, get in line with the kingdom of God. And it happened, right? Yeah. So we've got to learn to receive. How many of you is just flowing all the time there? Huh? <laughs> Prophetic words, healing, you, you see people in the street, they're jumping up and, huh? We want it, we, to get there, we've got to learn. That's partly what church is all about. And that's why we need to be nice. I don't know if you've noticed something. That 1 Corinthians was not written by Paul for weddings. Chapter 13. He didn't say, well, you know, I'm, I'm in chapter 12, I'm all about the manifestation gifts. Chapter 14, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of teaching about prophecy. And oh yes, before I forget, so that people can have beautiful weddings one day, I'll write chapter 13. Chapter 13, which is the love chapter that's the love that you need when you get into this supernatural stuff because you're going to have to do a lot of forgiving because people are going to make a lot of mistakes you know what I'm trying to say it doesn't come perfect so people are getting into the stuff the meeting place is the learning place for the marketplace this is where nice people are going to forgive you when you make a mess so that when you do it in pick and pay or in the boardroom, where they're not nice necessarily, you're doing it properly. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we want to give people, what I used to say in my old church is, we give you permission to do it badly and we're going to forgive you. Because if you never ever take a risk, you'll never do anything. You hear what I'm saying? So do it. And if you make a mistake, we will take you out there and we will nail you to a cross in the street. No, you know what we'll do? We'll just forgive you. Say, oh, you know what, Mike really made a mess today, but we're nice. So, Mike, that was really good, but it was wrong. 
well, we just won't say anything. You know what I mean? Okay, I think I've said enough. Have I said enough? Yes. Just one final quick, quick thing. When it comes to the manifestation gifts, you know, 1 Corinthians 12, those gifts are not constituted. You don't have them in your back pocket, walk around with them, take them out and use them. They are given situationally for getting the job done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says, Now, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given. And the word given is in the present continuous tense in the original Greek. After Jonathan Macris said how terribly we pronounce Greek, I won't even try and pronounce the word. But the Greek word is in the present continuous tense given, which means that it's given situationally for getting the job done. In other words, when you want to pray for someone, you get the gift situationally. You've got to learn to get stuff on the job. It's like going to fix a tap and you go as a plumber with an empty toolkit. And as you reach out to fix the tap, you put your hand into it. There it is. You get it situationally. So we want to learn to do that. That's how you do the ministry supernaturally. So why don't we just end off and invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us how to receive. I don't know if you noticed in that Great Commission, in the Acts 1.8 version, doesn't it use the word receive? Yes, it does. I underlined it there for you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my missionaries. We need to learn to receive. And we're going to spend time over the next weeks and months just receiving and receiving. Not so that we will get bigger and fatter, but that so we'll have stuff to give away. Freely you've received. Freely give. That's mission anointing, so that we can do the mission actions in the mission areas, locally, regionally, and globally. Why don't we pray? Why don't we stand? It's easier. Haven't you noticed it's easier to pray when you stand up? Because you don't get into the shampoo position, <laughs> which is self-protective. I'm going to do nothing. You see, so why don't we just open up our you can even lift up your hands. You know, when you lift your hands, what are you doing? You're saying, I surrender. I'm surrendered to you, Lord. I want to learn to receive. I want to just receive. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to, to come. I can sense uh, the Holy Spirit is actually here. He wants to manifest himself in your life. So just receive him. Just say, Holy Spirit, just fill me now. And as you breathe in the air, as it were, by faith, just receive. Receive the Holy Spirit. Remember how Jesus breathed on his disciples and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Just receive him. You can receive the Holy Spirit many times. There's a, an ongoing receiving. Someone said we need to keep receiving because we leak. We ask you today, Lord, for a fresh receiving. Holy Spirit, just come. Give us this anointing with power. Release your gifts so that we can do the stuff, so that we can do this mission, proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom, do evangelism, do social action, in the areas to which you call us, locally, regionally, globally. Let it begin in this meeting place. Let this meeting place become a learning place for the marketplace in the name of Jesus. May our church become a place where we're learning to do mission. We invite you, Holy Spirit, just to come upon your people even more. Maybe as God is touching you, sometimes what happens is he begins to put pictures into your mind. It might be he's giving you a prophetic word. Often the, 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 the Holy Spirit speaks to us in pictures. The, 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 the language of the Spirit is pictures. And uh, when, you, when you're ministering, sometimes you want to learn to flow with what, what you're seeing. It might be that God is, is giving you something there in that picture. So take note of these things. And it might be a very fleeting picture. So Lord, we just invite you even now. Give us revelation. 
Give us words of knowledge. Give us words of faith. Prophetic words. Teach us how to receive so that we can give it away. When you speak out a word in church, you're giving away. And in love, we, we receive it. We evaluate it. If it's rubbish, we just let it go. If it's good, we get blessed. And so, Lord, we just pray, begin to release your gifts. Release your anointing on this church. We want to be people of power in Jesus' name. People who give the supernatural away. We ask you for more. Is God saying something to somebody? What are you seeing? I'm just seeing right now. Uh, I'm seeing a hand. It's like the person is standing and their hand is... It could be the hand is even in a glove, but I can see that they... They're kind of moving the hand. That's what I'm seeing. Now, it just might be my imagination. And then, you know, you just say, forgive him. Be nice to him. But if this is the Holy Spirit giving me something, and I give it away, which I'm trying to do now, and you get, get it, you get blessed. So if there's somebody here who's got a problem with their hand, just begin to receive the anointing on your hand. Maybe, in fact, um, it's getting clearer and clearer to me. Maybe when, when your hand is cold, you battle to move it. Maybe you, you've got a, a problem that your hand is, is there's, there's not a lot of movement in this hand. Cold weather makes it even worse. Is there anybody like that? You really, your, your hand is bad in cold weather. Okay. Just there, Rose is standing there. Just somebody lay hands on her. And we're just going to speak. We're not going to pray. Was there somebody else with a hand as well? Okay, there's a lady there. Is it Merle? Lay your hand on her. You see, to do ministry, you don't have to get a degree in, in deep theology. All you've got to do is have a couple of hands, just put them on a person and just say, be healed. Give it away. So to Rose and to Merle, we're just giving it to you now. What we have received, we give you. We just say to these hands, be healed. In Jesus' name, we command you to be free, to be whole. If there's arthritis there, we command it to go in the name of Jesus. More of your power, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Now just imagine if we could minister like this to people who are not Christians. We're just giving away the power of God. It would be very difficult for them to argue with you. When they healed. And so Lord we just pray for more of your anointing. On Rose. On, on others today. You may be sick today. We haven't mentioned it. But there's healing in the name of Jesus. Just reach out. And say I'm receiving from the Lord today. For my spirit. For my soul. For my body. In Jesus precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. Do be seated. Tiny is just going to quickly share with us something that's on his heart. And then I want us to pray for Tiny and Pat. They're going to the Holy Land of Durban to do ministry to those heathens. And we're going to pray for them. So Tiny just wants to share something quickly with us. Thank you, Tiny. On Friday, Mike sent an email to the leadership. It was a missionary letter about Syria. This is very close to my heart because when I grew up in Bantry Bay as a little boy, I can remember Lebanese and Syrian people. Very sophisticated, highly intelligent people who come from long-standing generations of people. I was so taken by this that I phoned Mike yesterday and every one of you who has an email on the database at the church will get it tomorrow. It doesn't make for easy reading. But what it does tell you is the fact that in Syria, it doesn't matter, matter whether you're part of the official government or whether you're part of the so-called rebels, each is killing the other indiscriminately, children, adults, women, men. And we're looking at over 200,000 people that have been killed in the last three years. 
God is going to take what has been said in this church today and over the last couple of weeks, and he's going to mobilize us to move from being what I call cotton wool Christians to be on the cutting edge of what is happening. The Bible in, in chapter 19 of Isaiah tells us what is going to happen and has happened in Egypt since the Arab Spring began. The Bible also teaches about what is going to happen to Damascus in the last days. When you get this newsletter tomorrow, Frida will send it out from the office, this is not easy reading. But God is preparing us to realize that we are in a spiritual battle. And in 30 seconds, let me just paint this picture for you. As you move from the Middle East, we thought two million people dying in Sudan would stop the move of Islam down Africa, and it didn't. Last week, the British government told the British tourists to get out of Kenya. This is all over the newspapers. There are problems in West Africa, which we are aware of, where over 150 people per day are being killed because they're Christians. 53 churches blown up and destroyed in the last two years, and so on. God is preparing us, not to scare us, but to realize that faith comes out of adversity and power that we've been taught about this morning comes when we trust the Lord. May God bless us and teach us to be all on the cutting edge of what he's doing. Thank you, Tony. Why don't you come forward, Pat? We just want to pray with you, and uh, especially as you go to do ministry, uh, Tony's going to be talking about the, the, the challenges of Islam to the church, right? They gave me the title. I'm speaking on Saturday on the organized move by Muslims to Islamatize the continent of Africa and introduce Sharia law. Mm. Uh, there's, there isn't time now, but that's what I'm speaking about. We want to pray with you. Just a couple of you come and join me. Let's pray for them, that God would use them as they go. As his, this is part of the mission of God. Eh? Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for Pat, for Tiny. We thank you for the anointing that is on them. We ask that it would increase, that your power would flow. And that as Tiny speaks, that you would give him favor with the people that he speaks to and that this would be a divine opportunity in your kingdom. We just pray that you'd give him more stuff. Freely receive that you might freely give. Thank you, Lord. Thank thank you, you Jesus. Thank you. We just praise and worship you. We thank you for this couple that are sold out for your kingdom. That they are just ready to be used. We thank you. We bless that in them, in the name of Jesus. And protect them, their health, and keep them safe. We know how the enemy would attack. We pray that you would keep them, protect them even from uh, people who hate this message, in the name of Jesus. Your blessing be upon them. Thank you, Father. Bless you. Have a great time. And so Josh is going to come now, and, and Sandy, we're going to sing our final song. Maybe you'd like to stand. Should we, should we sing together?